I bring you greetings in the matchless name of my Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning, this is Reverend Bob Lico, the Honey Badger, bringing another Honey Badger bite to one and all this Christmas of 2021. As I was going through my news headlines this morning, as I do before prayer every morning, I noticed several articles uh, from the Roman Catholic news gathering uh, bot that I use talking about the Immaculate Conception of Mary, seeing that it is the Christmas season, how is it that Jesus, the Christ, God the Son, could be born of a human? Well, if you study Roman Catholic doctrine, there is only one biblical conclusion you can arrive at. It's very simple. And this is the fact that Jesus Christ did not die for the Virgin Mary. Now, let's look at the Roman Catholic doctrine. I'm going to make this very short and just bring it right out to where you can look at it and further research it. Try to prove me wrong, but I'm absolutely correct. Now, I quote, The angel calls her. Now, this is the Pope speaking this week. The angel calls her, full of grace. If she is full of grace, it means the Madonna is void of evil. She is without sin. Immaculate. I continue to cite Il Papa. In the decree, in Ephobus Deus, he wrote, We declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds the most blessed Virgin Mary in the first instance of her conception by a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved free from all stain of original sin is a doctrine revealed by God and therefore to be, be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful. That's Pope Francis hailing the beautiful, the beauty of Mary's heart. And you can read this article in its entirety and all of his statements in the Catholic World Report. I am in no way misrepresenting the sentiments of the Pope or his statements. These are direct statements. If she is full of grace, it means she is void of evil. Duh. She's without sin. She's immaculate. She's been totally preserved from sin. Even when she was conceived and her parents conceived her in the sexual union of her parents, in the first instance of her conception, she was preserved free from all the stain of original sin. And this is a doctrine revealed by God. Well, let's look at this. I say not so fast, Pappy, lest I get slappy. I would slap the Pope in the face. I don't pray for the man. And I've urged all of my followers and readers not to pray for him based on 1 John. Well, let's look at his statements. If she is full of grace, it means the Madonna is void of evil. She is without sin, immaculate. Really? Does, is that what it means by, by making the statement full of grace automatically preclude any sin or defection or defect at all? in Mary, morally, spiritually, physically, no defects. Does that what, is that what the term means? Is that what the angel was indeed proclaiming directly to her right then and there? I don't believe so. I think you can read this very easily as the way God talks 
to humanity. You see, our God is not bound by time. He is timeless. He is apart from time. He acts within our time frame, but he himself is eternal. No beginning, no end. So when he says things, they don't necessarily have to mean immediately. Here's some examples. Remember the example of God speaking to Abraham. When God called Abraham and spoke to him, he was childless. He was past the age of bearing children, as was his wife. And yet Romans 4.18 reminds us, and it's in many places throughout the Old and New Testament, that God calls Abraham the father of many nations. He says, hello, Abram. He changes his name. His very name meant the father of many nations. So every time anyone said Abraham, they said the father of many nations, come here. Before he had any children at all. He became the father of many nations. And I would say Mary became full of grace when Jesus was incubating in her womb. Because Jesus is the grace and totality of the grace and wisdom and love of God. All wrapped up in a human form. Let's take another example. Remember Gideon. Gideon's out there kind of threshing his wheat, running away from the Midianites, hiding in holes and caves. The angel of the Lord appears to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon was fearful and afraid and hiding and running away from the Midianites. He was anything but a mighty man of valor. His family was anything but a great family. They were the least of families. Read the whole story in Judges chapter 6. God calls him a great man of valor. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And I know Gideon's looking all around. Who are you talking to? Me? Not me. <laughs> I'm not a mighty man. And we know what happens. So what do we see? Just in these two examples, we see Yahweh's usual MO, mode of operation, is that he is a God who calls things that are not as though they were. He calls things that are not into existence. Romans 4.17 Isaiah tells me that he knows and calls the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46, verse 10. So he often speaks prophetically about his servants, and Mary is no different. I believe that that is certainly a prophetic, a, a statement of fact, but a future statement that was about to be brought to pass. She was about to become full of grace. Now, grace is unmerited favor. It, when you receive grace from God, theologically speaking, we are considering and, and understanding that God is granting us a benefit that we do not deserve. We couldn't do anything to earn. It's sovereignly given out of his goodwill. So the fact that the angel declares that she's full of grace doesn't mean that she is void of evil doesn't mean that she is without sin who needs grace well sinners we lack something that we can't obtain that we can't work for that we can't earn why because of our inherent sinfulness we just can't do it it's like trying to make someone your friend you may love the person want them to be your friend want to hang with them want to share your life with them but if it takes two to tango. Let's move on. Well, when you start with a faulty and biblically errant foundation, everything you build on it is going to crumble and not withstand the weight. Now I continue by citing and directly quoting the Pope. Mary, in the first instance of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God, 
in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, here we go, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God and therefore to be firmly believed and constantly, firmly and constantly by all the faithful. Now, I, immediately in my head, I put it in here, revealed by God exactly where ill pappy, because you're a sick man. Preserve free from all stain of original sin is a doctrine revealed by God. Where is this revealed by God? Even in your Second Temple Judaism books, Cult of Rome, that you include in your Bible, nothing is ever directly stated or even implied that Mary was sinless or had to be sinless. Adam and Eve sinned, and we know that through one man's transgression, what? Death spread to all men. That's all humanity, men and women, including Mary. Revealed by God, where in the Bible? Why would you tell me to believe anything that you cannot back up with biblical contextual text. If it was revealed by God, it would be in the Bible for all time for all of his people. There is nothing in there about Mary and her parents conceiving her in a sinless state. The cult of Rome has long denied the plain teachings of the Bible. The whole Protestant Reformation was based on this reality, and God has always had a remnant of people that will believe his word. This is one of my main complaints with the Lutheran sect. Luther did not go far enough. He did not make a break with Rome. The LCMS today is Roman Catholicism light. It really is, and I've already talked about that in many presentations on the Honey Badger Bob YouTube channel. Watch them. But Rome has long denied the Bible, and they are an unchristian, an ungodly, Bible-based cult. No different from the Mormons, or the Jehovah Witnesses, or the Moonies, or the Way International. They are just as bad a cult, actually worse. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 says this, Il Pappy. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, that means the death, burial, and resurrection that is in Christ Jesus. All have sinned, that includes Mary. There is not one text that says Mary never sinned. So to say that Mary is sinless is to say Romans 3.23 is not true. Psalm 51.5, the Old Testament, David said, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Look up the text. Now, that was not just particular, oh, that David was referring only to himself. No, he is speaking as a human about the common human complaint and plight. We are all brought forth in iniquity, and in sin we were conceived. Now, that's not an immovable barrier to our God, as we shall see. But the point is this, all of humanity, including Mary, was brought forth in iniquity, and sinfully conceived, conceived by morally and spiritually deficient people. Yet according to God's revelation, now, apart from scripture, I don't know what saint or what pope or when this was exactly revealed, but it's revealed by God and therefore it's an article of faith, Bob. You know, Lutherans use this too and, and it's a punt. 
In other words, it's something we don't have any Bible for, but we just believe it because we're told to believe it, and it's okay. Not how this honey badger lives his spiritual life, nor his household. You do not have contextual biblical support for your doctrine or practice. It may not be sinful or damning, but I'm not doing it. You see, my friends, Jesus Christ died for sinners only, which is great news because we're all sinners. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That was me. Hallelujah. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is what's called good news. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ, in this case Christ Jesus, God the Son, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. But Paul hadn't met me. I was a wicked person by the blood of Christ. I've been born again and through faith and faith in him alone established in his righteousness. What's Paul say to the Corinthians at the end of his letter, first letter to him? 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. So what do we see here? Romans 5, 6, 3, uh, verse 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Timothy 1, 15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins. And because all men sinned, as I mentioned earlier, death passed to all men, even Mary. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Answer me this, cult of Rome, how did Mary die? if she was sinless. My wife, for a few years as a young child, was raised in a Pentecostal cult. I've got to get the name right. I'm probably going to mess this up, but I believe it was called the Kingdom of God in Christ. It wasn't Koji, the Church of you know, the church and kingdom of God in Christ. She was, she was, in any event, I'll have to let Tracy explain it. But for a period of time, she was raised as a young child in a never die cult. This was an offshoot started very early on, 1918, 1919, by, again, a guy that got off and said, well, you know, if you will progress in sanctification, kind of a, a bizarre twist on maybe a, an aberrant thought of Wesleyan total sanctification, I'm not sure. Pentecostalism is a child of Wesleyan thought in many, many ways. But they believe that there were 10 steps. I have to look them up. Now it's interesting to me again. Uh, and on the 10th step, you would achieve sinless. You arrived at not sinning anymore, so you would not die. Now, you might be a very elderly person by the time you reach the, the, the pinnacle, but you would continue to live. Well, here's the sad fact. There's still one death per person for all of their pastors and teachers and luminaries. They missed it somewhere because they all have funerals. So my question is, how did Mary die if she was without sin, if she was immaculate? 
The wages of sin is death, Pope. You don't deny that, do you? It's right there, Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. Is the Bible wrong? Oh, well, it does not apply to Mary. Roman, uh, Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. It's appointed unto men once to die. Everybody got an appointment with death. But not for Mary. Right. Well, you see, if you're going to say Mary's sinless, and you're going to say Mary lived an immaculate life, she was born without sin, never sinned as a as an infant, a, a, a toddler, a child, a teenager, as a married woman after the death of her husband, the death of her son, and resurrection, the birth of the church, she never sinned one time, never had a cross thought, ne never sinned. But she still died. And yet I see that it's appointed unto men once to die. It's appointed unto men once to die because all men sin and the wages of sin and death. Death is coming. Prepare for it. Think about my dying every day. And I look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of my faith. And I can't wait to leave this body and to be united with the spirits of just men made perfect. Looking forward to it. I'm a day closer to the grave or his return today, and so are you. Hallelujah. Let me quote Pope Pius XII in 1950. This is when a new doctrine was believed and must be firmly accepted and received by all the faithful. Pope Pius declares, Now God has willed that the blessed Virgin Mary should be exempted from this general rule, Romans 6.23 and Hebrews 9.27 rules, she, by an entirely unique privilege, completely overcame sin by her immaculate conception. And as a result, she was not subject to the law of remaining in the corruption of the grave. And she did not have to wait until the time for the redemption of her body. Say what? Let me break it down for the non-cult members. What they're saying, the 411 on this, is that when Mary died, she wasn't buried in a tomb or a mausoleum or anything like that. And then her body just slowly decayed and returned dust to dust, ashes to ashes, the normal. So unless you're a Roman Catholic saint and your body is just a mummy that somehow seems to have not decayed a whole heck of a lot. It's still looking pretty daggone morbid to me. And somehow they're not in the grave and we're supposed to hang around the dead bodies and go pray in front of them. And uh, it's totally unclean in the Bible. But never, nevertheless, Mary was not subject to the law remaining in the corruption of the grave. She didn't have to wait. So when Mary died, again, I go back to Romans uh, 6.23, how did Mary die? She just told me again, completely overcame sin. She was sinless. How did she die, popes? How did she die? Think, think, Roman Catholic brother and sister, think. Don't just swallow and follow this BS. She was not subject to the law, remain corruption of the grave. Oh, really? Why? Where? Show me that in the Bible. Show me this in any history. Oh, what happened then, Bob? Well, her, she bodily, she died, apparently, was raised physically from the dead like our Lord Jesus and ascended physically into heaven like our Lord Jesus. She's in heaven bodily. She's the queen of heaven. She's ever living to stand before the throne to make intercession, to kind of go to the Jesus on our behalf. We go to Mary. Mary goes to Lord, Son, come on. Help them. That's their theory. It's a total lie. And this is a rather new and novel doctrine, less than 70 years old. Well, it's about 70 years, I guess now. But it is to be fully believed and accepted that Mary physically ascended into heaven just like her son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and that she was sinless just like our Lord Jesus Christ. That would make her indeed a co-redemptrix, which many Catholics buy into. Well, not only being a theologian, I'm also a philosopher, and I love the philosophical statement 
which it really explains reality to me, A is A and cannot be non-A. What does that mean? That means the thing is what it is, and it can't be anything other than what it is. Jesus, here's the A, Jesus died only for sinners. That is the biblical statement and premise. Mary had no inherent sin, committed no actual sin, and is called and seen to be sinless. Thus, Jesus did not die for the Virgin Mary. Do you understand? Jesus died only for sinners. Paul said Jesus Christ came full of full acceptation. Jesus died only, hey, and I'm the chief of sinners. He owned, for God so loved the world, he gave his son. So if Mary or anybody you know, and if you think you yourself have no real sin or issue with sin, well, the atoning death of our Lord Jesus Christ is not for you, my friend. Jesus didn't come for you. He didn't come for the righteous. He came to save sinners. And if you have no sin, Jesus is not your savior. His words are not for you. The cult of Rome has less than zero biblical text to support both of their doctrines, A, of Mary's sinlessness, it violates everything in the Old and New Testament regarding humanity and sin and the ubiquity of sin in our lives. Number two, they have less than zero biblical support at all for Mary's physical assumption into heaven. Uh, again, guys, they even admit, in the, you go back and read Pope Pius' doctrine on this. She died but was physically raised up from the dead and ascends into heaven. But she died. Wages of sin is death. How'd she die? They cannot, that is a mountain they cannot go under, they cannot go around, and they cannot go over. They have met the immovable object. And it's called the reality of her death. And the reality that her bones are still in a grave somewhere. And she is awaiting her reuniting with her physical resurrection body as we all are. You and I and Mary know Jesus died for her sins and was raised for her justification. And yes, she is in heaven because she believes that her son is in fact God the Son. Rome teaches its people lies about Jesus and about Mary and their damnable lies. People spend their entire Christian walk praying to Mary or some other deposed or dead saint. And have you ever noticed, I'll end with this, it'll be just at half an hour. Have you ever noticed that over 90, I'm guessing, but I'd say 95 maybe percent of Roman Catholic religious idolatry and statuary show our Lord Jesus is either an infant in Mary's arms, which is extremely common, or as a corpse being held by Mary. You never see our Lord Jesus very seldom as an adult in command. He is always an infant, always on Mary's breast, being coddled by her, he's just a little, you know, he has a little crown on his head. She has a huge crown and angels all around her and all of this. Little baby Jesus or dead Jesus. It is a cult, my friends. If you are part of a Roman Catholic congregation, you may have a priest that loves Jesus. There are many born-again Catholics. But your doctrines, the doctrines, the official doctrines of your cult, it's not even a sect. It's a cult. They use biblical words and terms, but they do not mean what the Bible means. And they deny the fact that people need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his death, burial, and resurrection alone in order to be saved. 
and not what the church teaches. Merry Christmas. <laughs>